Hi, in this video I am going to explain the problem with random number generation in Ethereum. Let's consider the following scenario. Imagine you want to create a lottery in Ethereum. People can buy a ticket and they get assigned a number. Our contract keeps a list of the participants and their addresses, and the winner is chosen randomly among the end participants. To choose a winner, we need to pick at random one of our participants, which is equivalent to choosing at random one position in this list. The question is, how do you generate a random number to choose the winner? We will see the answer in a second. But first, let's talk about random number generation as a general computer science problem. The first thing that we need to do is to keep in mind that in software, there is no such a thing as real random number generation. Instead, what we have is pseudo random number generation. This means that we have programs that can generate a sequence of numbers based on a seed. To initialize the program, you have to pass what is called a seed, which is the source of randomness for the generation. For example, the seed can come from the system's clock. A property that is desired for the seed is entropy. In this context, entropy is a synonym for the randomness of the seed. By design, if you pass the same seed twice to a generator, it is going to produce the exact same list of random values. That's why it's not a full random number generator, it's a pseudo random number generator. Let's see how this affects Ethereum. In Ethereum, you cannot generate random numbers. Why is that? Ethereum is a deterministic state machine. This means that all the nodes will run exactly the same code and all the nodes will arrive exactly at the same result. There are no sources of entropy in the blockchain, nothing we can use to get a seed that will be different in different nodes. Therefore, you cannot generate random numbers. If you have already used Solidity, or if you learn it in the future, you will see that there is no random function. This run function is very common in other programming languages, but is not available in Solidity. There are a few workarounds, though, that we're going to explore later in this video. First, we'll see how to use block variables to generate random numbers. Then, we'll move to commit reveal schemas. And finally, we will discuss oracles. These are just some methods, but there are many, many more. For example, verifiable random functions or verifiable delay functions. These are more complex, so I'm going to leave them out for this video, but feel free to Google them if you want to learn more. First of all, let's talk about context variables. Every block can access certain variables like Coinbase, block difficulty, gas limit, the block number, and the block timestamp. All these variables will be exactly the same for every transaction in this block. So now let's imagine how we could take advantage of this. Imagine you are playing a game where there is a contract called, let's say, Casino, that generates a random number every time the contract is called. And this random number somehow depends on one or more of these variables. Players, to win, they have to try to guess the number that is going to be generated. If they send the right guess, they are going to get some ether, otherwise they will lose their bet. Let's see how we could attack this contract. Let's keep in mind that any other transaction in the block is going to read the exact same values for all these variables. In order to attack this contract, we could create another contract with the same code to generate the random number. We could go to this casino contract, read the source code, see how the random number is generated, and copy-paste that code into our contract. Then, since all the variables are the same, we're going to generate exactly the same number as the casino, because basically we're running the same code with the same variables. Since we know which number is going to be generated, now from our contract, we can call the casino contract with the right guess, and we can win every time. Now let's see block hashes. Block hashes are used to create the chain of blocks. Each block has a reference to the block hash of its parents, all the way down to the very first block in the chain, usually called the genesis block. Now we'll see why you cannot use either past, current, or future block hashes. Let's start with past block hashes. The thing is that everyone knows past block hashes, and they could use them, as we have seen, in their contracts to know what's going to happen. The hash of the current block is generated after all transactions are added to the block and the block is mined, which means it does not exist at the time the contract is running, so we cannot even use it. Future block hashes are not perfect either. They have at least two potential issues. 
you can only retrieve the last 256 block hashes at any point in time. This is done for performance reasons, but it opens the door to some hacks. For example, if you Google Smart Billions Lottery Hack, you will see how one person already used this hack to extract 400 Ether from a contract. Also, miners can decide what to do with the block, depending on whether they will make a profit or not. Imagine, for example, a roulette. You bet on the color, black or red. And the contract shows black, let's say, if the block hash of the next block is odd, and red if it's even. A miner could make a huge bet, let's say $1 million, for red. If they mine the block, they can compute the block hash, and they can know if it's even or if it's odd. Or in other words, they know if publishing the block will make them win their bet or not. If they decide not to publish the block, they will not earn the money that comes from fees, but if their bet is big enough, they still have the incentive to do this. They can try to tweak the block to produce a different hash that is still valid and that makes them win. Now let's explore commit reveal schemas. There are different schemas, some of them are more complex than others, but the basic idea is that you have a certain number of participants, let's say n. Each participant picks a number, and from that number, they use a hash function to generate a commitment. All the participants submit their commitment, not the number, the commitment, to the contract that generates the random number. When all commitments have been submitted, participants start submitting also their original numbers. The contract can verify that the numbers that the participants are sending match the commitment that they sent earlier. The idea is that an attacker could not change his original number after he sees the numbers that others have submitted, because the new number would not match the commitment that the attacker sent. Once you have all the numbers, you combine them somehow to get a random number. A very common technique is to use the XOR operation, where you combine the bits of two numbers to produce one if they are different and zero if they are the same, and you do that for every bit in the number. Do not worry if you are not familiar with this operation, this is just a technical detail that does not change the basic idea behind the commit reveal schemas. There are also more complex alternatives, like Randau, based on the same ideas, but we will not cover them in this video. The problem with this approach is what is known as the last actor problem, and it's very common to many schemas. The last person to reveal their number can observe all the other numbers before revealing his. This last participant also knows how the random number is generated, which means he knows if his number is going to make him win before he reveals the number. So if he is a malicious actor, he can decide whether he will submit the number or not. Also, some schemas require that all participants reveal their number. So if the attacker decides not to reveal his number, he loses money and everyone else gets a refund. The workaround for this is to find participants who do not submit their numbers. However, there could be some cases where the reward is so much bigger than the fine that people still have the incentive to cheat. For example, in the lottery we were designing, if the attacker has 50% of the tickets, he can decide to only reveal his number if it will make any of his tickets win. If he doesn't win, only one of his accounts will receive a fine, and if he wins, he will make a lot of money. The last technique that we are going to see in this video is based on oracles. Your contract can connect to an off-chain service to retrieve a random number. For example, Chainlink is a very well-known oracle. You could connect to Chainlink and ask for a random number and then use it in your code. The problem with this approach is that we have introduced a third party, the oracle, bringing all the usual problems of centralized solutions. For example, you have to trust the oracle, the oracle becomes a single point of failure, it might not be online due to a DDoS attack, can be hacked, etc. To conclude, we have seen that generating a random number in a blockchain is a difficult problem, and there is no one-size-fits-all solution. It's all about trade-offs. The main takeaway from this video is that if you need to write a contract that relies on random number generation, you need to put care and deep thought into it, and you need to find the solution that best meets your requirements. If you found this content useful, leave me a comment, click like, and subscribe because you don't want to miss the next videos to learn more about Ethereum and cryptocurrencies. See you in the next video. This video is part of a free comprehensive course on cryptocurrencies that we have put together at teachyourselfcrypto.com. Check it out to learn more about Bitcoin, Ethereum, smart contracts, decentralized finance, and much more.
The link is in the description of this video.